My guest today knows a thing or two about hobbits and long forgotten gold. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Hey guys, welcome to the show. My name is Matt and I am your host. If you play role-playing games, and I really hope that you do, please check out DiceGeeks.com. You will find free RPG resources as well as books that I write. I am really excited about today's show. It was an absolute pleasure to interview my guest. Just being able to talk to somebody who was involved with such a major motion picture production as the Hobbit trilogy was just an absolute thrill. So um, I'm not going to waste any more time. My guest today is actor, stuntman, and creature performer, Mark Atkin. Mark, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Oh, oh no problem. It is, it is my pleasure. Now, I think it is quite possible that everybody listening to this podcast has seen you, but they just don't realize that. Um, Absolutely, yeah. If, yeah. if, if they're fans of the Hobbit trilogy, they, they've seen me a lot. <laughs> yes. So I was just going to ask, how did you get involved with Peter Jackson's The Hobbit Trilogy? Um, you know what? I'm one of the luckiest people in the world, and it was uh, a happy accident. I was living in Auckland. I'd moved there from London as a police detective. And a, and a fellow British colleague of mine um, sent me a link to open auditions for, for short people because they were filming <laughs> The Hobbit soon. And um, I, I'm five foot four, so when I joined the police in '96, I was the shortest male officer um, in my police force. And so you can imagine I've had every short joke ever. Okay. And so I kind of rang him and said, Oh, come on, do you think I've not been called Frodo or a Hobbit before? <laughs> um, uh, but he wasn't joking, he said, because he, he was on the, on the old police height restriction of about five foot seven. And he said, No, look, I'm too tall, but I really do think you should go. And um, it was on a Saturday afternoon, I, I was off, I'd done all my chores, and I literally drove across to this, um, this uh, gym hall at the university with about half an hour to spare, just out of curiosity. And uh, as I parked the car, I was like, if there's a queue, I'm not going in, and all this sort of stuff. And there was no queue, and I walked in, and they had a clipboard, and they'd marked the door frame because they wanted people five foot two and under. And so I took my shoes off and stood there and the AD, the assistant director, said, sorry, um, you're too tall. And I howled with laughter and shook his <laughs> hand and said, oh, you've made my day. It's the first time I've been too short for anything in my life. <laughs> and off I went. Um, but luckily, a lovely lady called Nicola Benton, who was one of the casting directors, came out of the hall at that time and said, where's he going? And it was like, oh, he's too tall. Was like, well, he's not that too tall, is he? So she called me back. And they interviewed me and they put me on camera and they took my measurements. And um, I really didn't think anything was, was going to come of it. And then about a week later, I had a call saying I've been shortlisted. And then 35 of us went down to Wellington and we had a three-day workshop where we did an acting scene, a sword fighting scene, and a mimicry scene that was filmed on the last day. And then they made some recommendations and showed these these clips to to Peter, Fred and Philippa and next thing you know I, I, I quit my job as a police officer of 15 years and pack my bags and, and go off to Auckland to to work in the movies so yeah very lucky life-changing um, yeah it was great. No, that's amazing now uh, just for the listeners what what was the main role that you played in the Hobbit trilogy? I was Richard Armitage is, I was his scale double. Um, Richard is six foot four. <laughs> and so he can't stand next to a human or an elf or Gandalf yeah. because he's taller than them. So basically, when Richard looks like a dwarf, it's me, basically. Mm -hmm. and, and so I was very lucky because I doubled for Richard. I was very busy. I worked with all the other guys you could think of really because once Richard had, once they'd shot Richard and they turned the cameras around on to say Ian McKellen as Gandalf or or whoever mm -hmm. um, it would then be me that kind of 
perform that scene with them and it's kind of my shoulder the back of my head <laughs> the back of me that kind of dirties that shot so pretty much if, if if richard was having a conversation with a human an elf or a wizard it was actually a three-way conversation because they would always be responding to me okay. uh, not richard a lot of the time yeah and also with the issues of scale i was very lucky that um, they realized for instance the, the moria gates flashback in the first movie that uh, it was an issue of scale. So I ended up doing that whole fight sequence in prosthetics. So it's me in slow motion, losing my sword and shield and getting knocked down the hill and, and defending myself with the, um, with the piece of oak, which of yeah. course becomes um, Thorin's name. Mm. Um, and so I, I think there's some behind the scenes footage of me talking to camera um, saying how proud I was of, of being part of that kind of, that law where you know Prince Thorin becomes Thorin Oak and Shield, and um, you know I was I was very very proud of it was like ten days work for for essentially a few seconds on on camera, but uh, it looked great, and um, um, I'm very proud to have been a part. I'm very proud to have been a part of the whole of the Hobbit, but um, knowing that that little bit is is me is is fantastic, really. So yeah, I, I basically stood in for Richard uh, when during many acting scenes, and luckily, um, lots of stunt scenes as well. He did have um, a stunt double as well, who taught me how to sword fight. Absolutely uh, fantastic guy called Marnie Davis. So I don't want anybody to think for a moment that I was his permanent stunt double. He had a very talented guy who, who's worked in many movies that have been filmed in New Zealand, and he taught Richard and I um, all the things that you see on screen plus many many times it's actually him in prosthetics so yeah between the three of us um Thorin oak and shield was a, a pretty cool guy yeah um, yeah. yeah now now when you uh when you're the scale double for richard armitage do you did do you study like richard armitage's movements in that or uh, absolutely yeah uh-huh. Absolutely. We had, and I think it's on the appendices of the Blu-ray and, and, and the DVDs, but um, I've been told about them. I haven't actually seen them. Yeah, I but, haven't seen them um, either. So. We, we did, we did uh, you know, two months of a, what they called a dwarf boot camp. And um, mm-hmm. we did sword fighting. We, did, we, we learned how to roll, how to fall, how to horse ride. Luckily, I could horse ride anyway. But mm-hmm. um, all of us went through this process. And part of it was, was learning to move like a dwarf and and we had um hours of, of training and it was the concept that the dwarves lived in the earth and were of the earth and so they moved through the earth not on it mm-hmm. um through it and over it and 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 just just solid grounded uh people uh, mm-hmm. that were were happy on and under the ground and moved on, on it and and so yeah, we we learned to walk and run and 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 fight as dwarves. And at first, we did it separately, and uh, with a, a movement coach who who coached uh, both the group of scale doubles and and the actors. And then they brought us together. And then it, obviously, the, it completely changed because, of course, there's one thing learning to move like a dwarf, as you've been taught. Then you have to move like a dwarf, like Richard Armitage moves as a dwarf. So. I had to alter what I did because of what Richard did. And, um, and also that changed again when they started introducing costume because we all had body suits on mm-hmm. and we all had huge boots. And in fact, I think there's some footage of us in, uh, where we trained the big sports hall when they brought some prototype boots in. And then as soon as the big guys were strapped them on and started running around. It just changed their movement, which of course changed our movement. So it was, it was, it was, it was kind of fluid really. We had these kind of guidelines and, and we learned the, all of us learned the basics, but then each individual actor had their own nuances, which each of the scalables had to, to learn themselves, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, and that's where like, people have always asked me uh, about the police work and acting and stunt work. And apart from the skills that you learn in self-defense and all that sort of stuff and firearms, which bring themselves to, you know, being a, being a, a stunt person for this, you know, the, the, the observation skills and the attention to detail and, uh, and the fact that I always used to make notes and stuff 
uh, helped me kind of map out how I would behave as Thorin and how kind of I saw Richard uh, behaving with uh, as Thorin. But that was just kind of the boot camp and in the early stages. But then it kind of becomes natural to both of you, really. And you, you know, if often I would have seen, I, I would be watching Richard, but often, well, sometimes I hadn't. And so, you know, as he's, he's been wrapped and wants to get out of all his gear, you know, I have to, Richard, you know, I haven't seen this. Can you just tell me how you did, did, that, did, did this, that, or either? And he was always very uh, patient and um, helpful. And, um, and, and by the end of the shooting, because it was a long time, a few times I, look, I haven't seen this, Richard. He said, just, just, you know what to do, just kind of enjoy it sort of thing. You know, he, um, mm-hmm. he trusted me, he trusted me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is, which is lovely because I, I, I'd been a policeman and then kind of fell into this. And then I did my performing arts degree afterwards. And that's when he kind of studied the mechanics of acting and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And, um, I was still in New Zealand and Richard uh, was on daytime TV uh, in, in the UK and was asked about scale and his scale. one was, very blessing, very complimentary about me and, and, and how lucky he'd been to have me. And that was an ex-policeman and how you know, focused I was and, and all that sort of stuff. But then he also mentioned how difficult he'd found it to kind of give Thorin away. Mm-hmm. He'd created this, this, this King of the Dwarves. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, it was hard to let somebody else kind of do it, i.e. me. And I, I probably wouldn't have quite understood that at the time, but, having gone through the process of, uh, of going to drama school, I, I completely understood what he meant. You know, it's, mm. it's kind of, you know, it's his, his baby, his creation mm. that he's very proud of and, and has worked, worked very hard to, to create and to sustain over such a long, you know, long shoot, three movies all shot at once. And, and so to have to let this, this guy, he's got no previous experience at all kind of, do things on your behalf was mm-hmm. you know, we found it difficult but it was lovely to somebody sent me that um interview and, and it was great to uh to to listen to to him speak in such um, high regard of me so that that kind of means I, I did my job well because <laughs> a on screen nobody realizes it's me and b richard was very very happy with with what i'd done you know yeah that's great um now i guess just to follow up on a couple of things uh you you had mentioned like uh, they came out with boots and costuming. Um, you also had a makeup process as well. What was some of that like? Well, uh, most of the time we had masks, okay. the scoundrels, and um, which literally it probably took 10 or 15 minutes to put all of us in our masks. And so it was pretty much they took face casts of all of us and then so basically the inside of the mask fitted my face and the outside mm-hmm was kind of Richard with his prosthetics on. And that was simply f- because of time and cost and the fact that we were in mid shots and long shots. And so uh, it, we, they didn't have to worry about the detail. And so that was, we literally just had our hair tied back, and the, the guys with long hair and, and, the, and, the, and the women, of course, because at least half of the scandals were were women, which uh, many people don't realise. And then it was just just to make around your eyes um, kind of dirtier and uh, make them more the flesh colour of the masks as, as opposed to your own. But then, for instance, Moria Gates uh, walking in Brie at the beginning mm-hmm. of the, the second movie, which is me walking into the Prancing Pony. Mm-hmm. It, that was, you know, I'd be picked up from a hotel at like four in the morning. Uh, so I was ready to go on set around eight. Mm-hmm. So that's um, wow. hours of – so the prosthetic for me was um, from – it was a forehead, so the piece went halfway onto the top of my head, and then it went all the way down. And so the brow uh, was more pronounced and the nose was more pronounced, and then it stopped on my top lip mm-hmm. and went across to my ear. So that all had to be glued on and then had to be blended into me, into my eyes and the rest of my face and made, you know, dirt because, you know, dwarves don't shower every morning, they're kind of grubby and dirty. So there had to be kind of all that sort of stuff. And then the wig over the top and then the beard and the, uh, yeah, and then the beard. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
and the ears. So, uh, so yeah, you, you talk in, yeah, picks up at four. So probably th- over three hours in the hair mm. and makeup chair. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now the 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 gates of Moria scene, um, just you know, of course, in the you know in the final film, you know, you you see uh, Thorin battling the the white orc and things like that. Well, yeah. In that in those shots, what are you reacting to? Is there a person in motion? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There was. Um, the, again, I think Weta and uh, the Hobbit have put out. Um, some kind of behind the scenes yeah, stuff. True. Um, originally, Azor looked very different. He was um, one of my colleagues, a very tall stunt guy in full prosthetics. Mm-hmm. Uh, and his character became one of the uh, walk riders on the walls, actually. They, they, they changed it all. Mm-hmm. Um, so he still exists and he's, he, he's, he's, he's in the movies because he looked really cool. Not that Azov doesn't, but it was it was just different, and of course. Uh, so basically, he was in this prosthetics, and he's of course very tall, like six foot five, something like that. Mm-hmm. And so very imposing to kind of see in the flesh, if you like, this guy. Mm-hmm. And he had a mace, but the mace. The only difference really was that the mace had been coloured green, so they could CGI it even bigger. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that is there's no faking any of that scene. We we fought on top of that hill many, many times um, uh, for that for that shot. So, yeah, he um, and a few times I was because he after each take you've kind of got nothing left. You know, it is. I know it's just it's fake, but for that intensity and the, and what you're wearing and there's so many people around you and taking the fall and all that sort of stuff, it, it's tough. You know. I, I, mm-hmm. Sounds really bad. I, I consider myself kind of a fit, healthy guy, but I I was shattered each take. So the guys kind of picked you up off the floor and plumped you on a seat, and then the hair and makeup guys and the costume guys and the armory guys make sure you look how you should. Uh, while the while the stunt guys and and Andy Circus are looking at the playback and so giving you notes and stuff, and um, it was yeah, it was it was even though it's, it. It stunt work. It was a, it was a proper battle between the two of us. And, and you know, I heard a few notes, and the notes to to him were hit him harder. <laughs> <laughs> just smash him. Just smash him. Just That's got to be great. <laughs> smash him. Oh, great. And you know, suddenly you now you're fine. So <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I actually, I only learned that whole sequence that morning. There's uh, Mana and uh, Tim and Augie and Paul. Had all the only other stunt guys had, had, had created this whole fight, and then because uh, we had to stay on set because at the drop of the hat you could be needed to to, to mm-hmm. fill in the scene. Uh, we were, I didn't get a chance to go and, go and see it and learn it, so I was I, I was in half of my makeup, half of my costume on that mound while the guys were dressing it with dead dwarves and shields and arrows and blood and all that sort of thing. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think again, I think it's on the behind the scenes. Man, I'm in full gear, and Marna is the guy going through the moves with me as Azog. Um, Marna being Richard's uh, kind of full size stunt double, um, mm-hmm. teaching me all that. So I, I learned it that morning, and then um, we shot it. And as I say, the whole sequence, including the other bits and bobs, uh, I think it took ten days in the end. Um, ab- oh. Absolutely exhausting, but. Uh, brilliant just wow we're 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 in a battle with orcs it is brilliant yeah (laughs) yeah i mean it's a fantastic sequence uh you know when i saw it on the big screen um just i guess just out of curiosity who directs you does peter jackson direct you or is uh, a second unit directors or how does that uh, work depends um i I work with both of course um sure but for, for the Battle of Moria Gates, and I think it's in the appendices, uh-huh. uh, it was Andy okay. Serkin who was second on the Okay. So, yeah, that was Andy. That was Andy okay. Which is great. And, uh, yeah, a, f- a few of those things like that were Andy. But, uh, for instance, I, my, you know, I, I don't think I'll ever beat my, my first ever day on set, and it was in Bag End, which mm. is the foreign arrives late, and he, he's telling you the dwarves that the others won't come, and, 
mm-hmm. um, and, and then he's talking to Gandalf and, and, and Bilbo faints and stuff. And so I walked in and, uh, of course, main unit directed by Peter um, sat next to Ian uh, with Martin behind me and uh, Richard just off um, doing, doing his lines and, and Jimmy Nesbitt down the other end. And he just he's just like, whoa, you know, can it ever get any better than this? <laughs> In fact, I, I, I'd met, I hadn't met Peter. The first time I'd met Peter. And um, I, I, I went and shook his hand. Uh, I couldn't help it, really, which probably seemed unprofessional, but I don't think it was. And he, seemed, <laughs> he seemed appreciative of it at the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so it's a combination of both, depending on okay. uh, what the scene was. But I, I work both with Peter and with Andy as well. Okay. No, that's that's fantastic. Um, um, I guess so. Then, I guess I'm trying to put it together. So, if you are a scale double for you know for Thorin, and then yeah. uh, Gandalf is talking, they're they're looking at you. But is Richard Armitage offset saying his lines? Yeah, often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if you, I mean, I I always used to learn the my, uh, Richard's lines from the sides. Uh-huh. Uh, when I came, when I came in in the morning, mm-hmm. so I, I so I made sure and you know you, you had uh, a scale double for each actor and a couple of other guys and we we were all from shall we say normal walks of of life mm-hmm. you know none of us were actors or stunt performers before we you know we had uh, students we had nurses we had uh, plumbers mm-hmm. we had boat builders you know. Mm-hmm. Just this group of short people from around New Zealand that have been brought together to do this, and um, so we had acting coaches that, that were with us, and and so if I knew I was going to be working that day, um, I'd get a copy of the sides, the sides of the little tiny small uh, script for what's being shot that day, and I made sure first thing in the morning I went to one of the ads and and, and had a copy of the sides, and then I would read them over breakfast and then grab one of the acting coaches and they would play all the other parts. And, um, I would, I would learn, learn the lines, um, during the morning and then, um, go on to set and, and then watch Richard. And of course, Richard's performance would then dictate how I performed. Cause of course, and, and I used to, even if Richard was there, I would still at least kind of whisper the lines cause I needed them. Uh, so I would move properly, you know, it's not just movement, you, you know, you're talking, you're having a conversation. So mm-hmm. you need, you need, you need all of that. Mm-hmm. But then sometimes, you know, Richard, Richard was, was wrapped or had to go to second unit himself or vice versa. So we kind of swap. Uh, and so um, I would deliver the lines and there's lots of scenes in, in Lake town when Thorin walks through and, 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 you know, tells people who he is, you know, you know whether it was a variable, we've come to a day in our kingdom. Basically, Richard, the, the, the late tone people around me couldn't hear Richard on the on the loudspeakers. So, for for those scenes, we both did it. So Richard did it over the loudspeaker, so the guys on the periphery could hear, and I did it <laughs> in the middle of, of of the late town, so so they they could hear. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, more often than not, uh, Richard would be there to to deliver, deliver his lines had he as he'd performed them earlier in the day or was going to perform them later in the day or had done a previous day. Yeah. No, no, that's fascinating. Now, I guess I I should ask, were you a fan of the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings before you were in the movies? Absolutely. Um, when I went to, I'm showing my age now, but, uh, when I went to grammar school, when I was 11, our English teacher, the first thing we did was the Hobbit. Mm -hmm. And so I loved the Hobbit. And then I read, so I read The Hobbit when I was 11, and, um, mm. and I grew up in Staffordshire, which is, which is near Birmingham, Birmingham, so it's kind of Tolkien country, really. <laughs> and so we loved The Hobbit, and we actually put together, we, our end of term project was like an illustrated version of The Hobbit, and I remember I, I fancied myself as a bit of an artist and somebody who could draw in those days. So um, mm. I, I drew the eagles. Uh, oh, which I really remember. And um, so, yes, I, I love The Hobbit. And I read The Rings as an adult, actually. Mm-hmm. And 
and so I was very happy when I heard that they were turning the Lord of the Rings into into movies and um, and loved them. Yeah. Um, as, but I said to you at the top of the interview, my involvement was was so random, really, and so lucky. Mm-hmm. And my friends and family say you shouldn't say that you're lucky. You've always worked hard at whatever you've done. You, <laughs> you deserve to be there and all that sort of stuff. But mm-hmm. it, it, was, it was, you know, it could be. I, I'm not a fatalist, but maybe it was fate or whatever. But um, yeah, it, it was. It was. It was a, a privilege to have, have been in the Hobbit. Yeah, I I can only imagine. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Now, I guess moving on to some of your other work, uh, you were in Krampus as well. I was. In fact, all of the dark elves were hobbit scaledables. Oh yeah. Yeah. Or every single one. Every oh, okay. single one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, same casting director, and mm. you know, you, you pull these people from. You know, general public in in New Zealand, and 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 they do this body of work for you for two years. When you want a bunch of of little guys to be <laughs> weird, creepy creatures, that, that you know, that's the first group of people they call. You know, mm-hmm. so it was kind of like a, a Hobbit style double reunion, really. Okay. And, um, and it was fab, it, it, different. It, you know, it was it was eight, nine maybe 12 week shoot compared to the 18 months and then the three months pickup of the Hobbit. So very mm-hmm. different animal for, for all of us really. And it was hard work in your boots and your body suit and, and, mm-hmm. and your mask or your prosthetics on the Hobbit. But, um, I would, I, I think the uh, costumes from the Krampus were more difficult to, to work in, to be honest. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask about that. The costuming, they, they seemed extraordinarily elaborate. Unbelievable. Uh, unbelievable. I, I, I one day hope I can work for um, Weta Workshop one day because it's <laughs> like an adult kind of playground. You know, you yeah. walk in there uh, and, you know, you, you walk down one corridor and it, you're lined with costumes and armor from lying the witch in a wardrobe and then you turn a corner and there's a, a guard of elves uh, just anything that they've ever done when you walk around that place is there never mind what the guys are, are working on now and for the future you know it's uh, it's it, it's uh, one of the best places on earth and richard taylor who obviously created weta yeah. is such a lovely man and so kind of Considering he's a knight of the realm and he's won Oscars, uh, like Peter, very down to earth kind of Kiwi guys. And how you know how are you, Mark? And I've been into uh, the Weta Cave just to you know, buy some stuff to post back to England for my family. And and oh, you know, hi, Mark, how you doing? And uh, Richard's in. Do you want to say hello? And it's like just <laughs> unbelievable, really. And I've been spoiled, you know. I've been spoiled. it's my only experience in the film industry, and, and it's with these wonderful wonderful creative but also down to earth people but um so yeah we I, uh, we went in there and and in one of the studios there was like a each kind of work station had a different elf on it and we we kind of we were staggered in our appointments but we ended up kind of we're all half of us were there in the end because you kind of you knew the people because you'd worked with them on the hobbit and they were so so enthusiastic about the costume and the, this creature because they created it and you you know and they kind of give it to you mm-hmm. and they're showing you this stuff and then the next guy comes in and, and oh how you doing i'll stop look at yours because we didn't know who was who or who was going to be what and so and you, and yeah you look that it just the attention to detail and the amount of work that goes into the into these things is unbelievable and um should always be kind of acknowledged and respected really um I, I, I was Kit Crawker, uh, who, and I didn't have horns. I had a knife and fork instead <laughs> um, coming out of my head. And my trousers <laughs> were made from a Christmas jumper. Okay. Well, so one of my legs was like the sleeve of a Christmas jumper, uh, and then my other one was like a baggy kind of clown. Clown's called a baggy leg, do you know what I mean? Uh-huh. And, um, 
these guys and literally one of the guys that was in charge of creating these costumes it it was his christmas jumper <laughs> it was like there were people bringing ideas in and bringing stuff from home and you know uh, going around wellington uh, looking for for interesting things and stuff and he brought in his his uh, christmas jumper and he, his christmas jumper became my trousers it's just when he first told me i thought he was joking and then because it, it, the trousers hadn't been developed but even though it was kind of beginning of the year it was obviously it was a christmas film so you go to their studio and, and room and it was all full of christmas things and he had a christmas jumper on the first time i met them when it was just the face mask and sketches and things and then and he had his christmas jumper on and then i went back mm-hmm. and this christmas jumper that he's wearing it was now um my trouser leg and stuff it was just brilliant <laughs> absolutely brilliant um the only kind of sad thing about it is that three of us in Krampus underneath our huge masks and hoods mm-hmm. we had prosthetics on um, we had a full face prosthetics and red uh, eyes mm-hmm. uh, every, and the idea was that there was at some point there would be a reveal our, our masks would get knocked off and you would finally see what the dark elves look like underneath Mm-hmm. Um, and you know things changed, um, and that never happened. But mm-hmm. for the whole of the shoot, three of us had um, a couple of hours in prosthetics for like a full face. And, and Wetter have, have released some of the pictures to me, so I think I think on my Instagram there's a picture of me being kind of made up in the chair with a full face on, and they were fantastic, mm-hmm. absolutely fantastic. But uh, for reasons that I'll never know. And um, never had that reveal, which is which I think is a shame. But because again, these faces have been created, and they were put on to us every day by these fantastic makeup artists. And and, and apart from a few stills that I have, I never saw the light of day really. But that's hmm. that's kind of the film industry, isn't it? Really, you know. Yeah. yeah. So hmm. now, I'm just kind of wondering when. When a director or somebody says, "Okay, Mark, you're a dark elf," like, like, what goes through your mind? Like, how do you, how do you prepare for that? Well, you don't really. Um, <laughs> again, they they auditioned us in pairs, which was unusual. Okay. And we went to Weta actually, and they again another kind of studio space, and they had Luke Hawker, who's a fantastic actor and performer who who was Krampus. But he his day job, if you like, if you can call it that, he, he actually creates things at Weta. Mm-hmm. So he he truly is living the dream. He um so essentially he was Krampus mm-hmm. and he, he created his own Krampus costume. Um which is brilliant. Yeah. Um and so he was there and it, and then we're in pairs and it's okay and Mike Mike Doherty was just the director who did Trick or Treat and stuff and has recently done Godzilla, you know, he's just got a wonderful mind and a wonderful vision. And he's kind of, right, um, you two guys are stalking. Like Luke was there, but he wasn't playing Krampus. He was playing like the father, if you like. Mm-hmm. And it's like, hey, you're stalking this guy and you're kind of creeping around and you're talking to each other and signaling. And then one of you has to go and kind of grab him, but the timing is wrong. So then you get upset with your fellow dwarf and stuff mm-hmm. and you just take that direction uh, and that vision and that enthusiasm and it obviously worked because they cast me so um mm-hmm. yeah so you just you just kind of go with it and again lucky that all of us that in, auditioned in pairs had, uh, knew each other so well from the hobbit you know so there was kind of a connection and a trust there mm-hmm. and so straight away certainly the the two of us just went kind of straight into these kind of creepy kind of um, uh, just oh, I don't know how to explain it kind of like, as if we had our own language and like signaling and all that sort of stuff or like kind of creepy but comedic you know mm-hmm. and and kind of stopping and you know shrugging your shoulders when the person attacks them when you didn't want them to and all that sort of stuff really so so for so yeah Mike's Mike's vision and Mike's direction really certainly for the audition and then it's all about, of course, the costume makes a lot of difference. Mm-hmm. And the fact that we all had these wooden masks on because we were hiding how we actually looked. But, of course, knowing what you look like underneath because you 
had those prosthetics on um, every day. So you, knowing that you were like this kind of creepy, um, almost non-human, grey, red-eyed thing underneath kind of helped. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, and we're, all of us were different. We're all very, new, even though we're dark elves, every costume, every character was very different and very new, unique, different weapons, different looks. Because some of them were like those porcelain dolls who were kind of a little more, a little more, serene until you know needed to kind of mm-hmm. try and kill the family and stuff whereas yeah one of them had the big kind of hook from uh you know the plague doctors so you know like the medic mm-hmm. uh, almost like a little beast who, who looked after the toys and so even though we were dark elves and so we were kind of low and kind of you know long nails and you know trying to scratch people and you know, bite people and just kill, kill at the drop of a hat, you know, mm-hmm. Krampus, Krampus directed us all. We just felt like it. Um, each of us had our own little nuances, which was based on our individual look, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah. And, and, and again, a group thing, you know, we, there was nine of us and we would kind of have training sessions and you'd talk about and move in a certain kind of low kind of quick kind of head movement and also that if you're in your own kind of gym gear you can make these movements look fantastic but they're lost when you have the the you know the body suit on mm-hmm. and the clothes and, and the big head mm-hmm. so, so then you have to kind of exaggerate it or, or make sure that you can see yourself mm-hmm. in the costume so you so that these little nuances aren't lost because they obviously need to be bigger. Um, you know, the human, the person underneath is making quite big, exaggerated movements, but for mm-hmm. the creature, they look quite small and subtle. And so that you have to make that kind of step, that jump from training it in your own kind of training gear and getting the movement right and then realising how much maybe is lost inside the costume and, and, and altering those movements. So, so what you'd captured is shown when you're actually the character, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't seen the movie Krampus, but I watched some of the clips. Terrible. <laughs> what? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I know it did really well. <laughs> uh, it did really well. And actually I have some friends who highly recommend it. So I will, I will try to see it, but I, I haven't yeah. seen it, but I did, I did watch some of the clips uh, from your reel. And I mean, this might be a trivial question, but I was wondering how, how did you even see out of those masks? We, we barely didn't. Okay. We barely didn't. We barely didn't. Um, yeah. The, 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 the masks that we all wore on the Hobbit, uh-huh. kind of gave you tunnel vision huh. and you pretty much lost your hearing straight away because oh, wow. um uh, yeah very muffled however the uh krampus was more difficult because it was the the, the masks were huge mm-hmm. and they were off your face mm-hmm. at least the because it's kind of our faces on the inside and the and the dwarfs on the outside you had some vision uh, it wasn't tunnel actually there was a bit of a bit of peripheral vision but you could you could see relatively well however because the the big um, dark health masks were off our faces so you were kind of looking into darkness through two little eye eye holes mm-hmm. and so it was it, it wasn't even tunnel vision it was it was, yeah, and we kind of didn't realize that until we started rehearsing the stuff in the house. Mm-hmm. And uh, I actually swing through the living room window on a chain, mm-hmm. and we'd re- we two of us went, did it one after the other. But I was I was the larger one, so I was going through first. Mm-hmm. And we rehearsed it as well in your gym gear with your stunt pads on with mats and I must admit for a day we crashed and burned the two of us because we didn't quite get it right. And then we realized, mm-hmm. you know, how to land it. And then, so we were going in, landing it and doing our thing. And then even in our costumes, but without hoods and masks, we were fine. We were absolutely fine. And then the minute they put the masks <laughs> and the hoods on, we were, we just, I, I, 
because basically I was going feet first from a platform on a chain and you can see you can you look at the chain you look at your feet you, can, you know and you can see where you're going to land and all that sort of stuff mm-hmm. as soon as we put our masks on it was we didn't we were just yeah we might as well have been blind it, it was really really difficult and in fact the guy that flew in behind me a, a guy called ravi they changed his basically he became a different dark elf because the mask he had he had no chance of being able to see so he had to become a, one of the other uh, so basically t- two of two of the dark elves swapped characters simply for him to do that stunt because he couldn't see mm. in his chosen character and then for me i had to have basically they drilled that i've got quite a you know with basically they drilled huge holes in my nostrils of my nose <laughs> and took out basically the teeth that Kekuka has got. Um, the mouth is kind of filled really. Um, and they cut it all out. Uh, and so I, I had, apart from the teeth, an open mouth mm-hmm. and, and massive nostrils. So I could look through the nostrils and the mouth as I jumped off the platform to go through the window really and uh, and we only had one take which was yeah. huge pressure on the two of us really um and yes in my reel i have me going through and landing mm-hmm. and then quite coolly sweeping past the camera with my claws mm-hmm. and i saw it on the playback and thought that's great that's definitely in the movie <laughs> and then you watch the movie and it's not in what? <laughs> my feet come through the window and then it cuts the rest of the dark owls running in and it's like are you kidding me oh. but that's uh, that's just the way it works you know what I mean? <laughs> oh. at least i got the footage at least they sent me the footage so i can use it for my reel yeah <laughs> <laughs> but again i'm very proud of that because it was it was tough yeah. you know in, in your gym gear with your pants and your helmet on after a few hours you know a few goes you've got it sussed uh put the costume on yeah we still got it put the hood and the mask on where the hell are we, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, and, and yeah, so much pressure. Look, this, we, this is one take. We're not doing it again. So yeah, uh-huh. it was, yeah, that was a stressful day. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, Mark, um, oh, what are you working on nowadays? Um, I, I'm, I'm back on the Northern hemisphere now. And okay. um, I have got myself an agent in London. I, I was, have you heard of rocket man, the Elton John movie? That uh, came out yeah, in the- a little bit, yes. Yeah, I uh, I start the fight in the pub to <laughs> Saturday nights all right for fighting. So okay. That, so yeah, I get I I nick some of these pints and I get beaten up and 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 and, and start a massive pub fight, which was which is which is great fun. <laughs> but that came out in the summer. Um, I've 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 recently moved to Ireland and I've been doing some stuff on a TV series here called Young Offenders, okay. which is like a a Cork City uh, comedy, and which is on RTE and, and the BBC, and also I did something called the Brigade. I was I was a British soldier that was shot uh, when they were recreating some of the Irish um, independence in in post World War One in the twenties with the original uprising. So yes, I've got some nice little footage of me getting shot. Um, so that's all happened since since I came to Ireland in March, which is which is which is good. Uh, um, lots of little things keeping myself busy. Okay. And then I've I've written one short film, which I need to shoot. I found a location and some props, and it's a creepy little thing with just me in a room. I won't give any more away, but um, as I say, I just need to start filming that. And then. Um, I, they will say, you know, and as you probably know with your background, you know, shoot what you know and <laughs> use the places that you know and the people that you know. And yeah. I've got a, I've got a little nugget of an idea for some of the friends that I, I, I have now here in Cork. It could be kind of a crime sort of comedy thing. Um, I've, I've got the characters and the location mm-hmm. and lots of scenes in my head, but I don't have... I don't actually have the backstory, which is the wrong way of doing it. But I thought this is going to be this could be a really cool, kind of quirky, funny short film. So yeah, I, you know, if if people aren't going to put me on camera, then I'm at the moment, then I'll put myself on camera. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Mark, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Um, I will link up your IMDb page and your official website in the show notes for this episode at dicegeeks.com. And uh, uh, just thank you so much for being on the show. No problem. Anytime. And, and please keep in touch. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Well, there you have it, guys. I really hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Mark. As I mentioned, I have linked up his personal website as well as his IMDb page in the show notes for this episode. You can find them at DiceGeeks.com. Now, if you play tabletop role-playing games and you want some free stuff, please head over to DiceGeeks.com slash free and you will find 10 free dungeon maps plus some other PDF resources you can use in your campaigns. Also, if you enjoyed conversations like the one we had today, please consider supporting the show on Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash dicegeeks and check out the different support levels. Every bit of support is greatly appreciated. Thank you for listening, and until next time, keep gaming.